Alrighty, I am back with another Q&A. As you can see, I'm wearing these uh, Rode Video Micro Go microphones, which have been great. I love these things, super convenient. I think I am gonna get the Sony mic that goes in the hot shoe, that doesn't require a cable, that is, is not only a shotgun mic and a directional mic, but it's also an omnidirectional mic that flips with a switch on the back, and it's analog and digital. And it's a little, a little mic I can use in the hot shoe, and that eliminates me having to uh, mic up myself. Know what I mean? Plus, then I can use these mics for someone I'm interviewing. But anyway, I'm in my office. I wouldn't exactly call this a sexy office. When we moved in here, my wife immediately took the best room for her office, her studio. And I was relegated to this, which is not sexy. There's no purple gels in the background. There's no red gels. There's no blue gels. I don't have like fluorescent tubes in the background. I know that's very popular. I don't have any of that. I have a skylight. So hopefully that works. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. I've got a bunch more Q and A's on the way. By the way, I don't have shoes on either, full disclosure. I got up at 5.30, read really good book about uh, not only the Holy Grail, but about book antiquities. Very interesting subject matter. Read that for a while, did yoga, did my normal routine. Sat in my portable sauna, which I do for Lyme. I try to do it once a day, sometimes two, depending on my schedule. It's a cheapie. Don't think I've got some fancy sauna. This thing folds up into a little pack and it's, it's cheap, but it's some of the best money I've ever spent. Did that, and then I worked on the van for probably an hour and a half just to try to get it ready for this roadie. Move some things around, got my bike re-situated, re-fixed in there, emptied out the van, cleaned it, put stuff back in. Gotta be ruthless about this because not everything is gonna fit and my wife is gonna be uh, muy unhappy. Thank you for sending in questions. And remember, I am one guy with one set of answers that you may or may not agree with. Question number one, is this thing focusing? Apparently it was focusing. There is progress being made. So the first question is about, uh, I think the first YouTube film I made, like real film that someone else asked me to make was about, I casually mentioned to someone Mark Silber from Advancing Your Photography that I had gone to Albania and I'd shot one lens the entire time I was there. One camera, one lens. Now there are a multitude of reasons why I did that, but he was like, really? You went all the way over there and you shot everything with the same lens? And I go, yeah, for me, that's a relief. So, and I mentioned that it was a 50 millimeter. So I did a little film called Going Solo with the 50 mil that actually on his channel went gangbusters compared to my channel, but he's got a bigger audience. He's been doing this for a long time. And so it's kind of, I, I've received, I don't know how many questions over the years, uh, over, not over the years, over the time frame in which that film was posted about this very thing. And I'm not entirely sure why it's kind of difficult for people to grasp, but I look at using a single lens as a relief because then you just don't have to ever think about what you're doing ever again. You just photograph. But one of the questions that I've gotten that I think is actually really valid in regards to this is why would I choose a 50 over a 35? So that's a great question in my opinion. And that's question number one. Let me, let me go back in time here. When I started in photography, when I was really coming up, um, when I very, very first got started, the camera of choice was Nikon. And it was like an FM2, FE2, that kind of thing. And most of the people that I knew, most of the photographers that were helping me get started were Nikon shooters and they were fixed lens shooters. 28s, 35s, sometimes 24s, sometimes 20, 85s, 135s, 1828. Those were the hot lenses, 300 to 8. But most of the people who were helping me were press photographers. So they had multiple camera bodies on them at all times. And they would typically have a wide, a medium, and a long telly. Because when you're a news person, you never know what's going to happen and you got to be prepared. So I graduate from school. I start working as an intern. I've got Nikon F4s, which were complete piece of crap cameras that kept breaking every single time I would use them. I got first gen F4s. They just were not good cameras. They were not reliable. And just at this moment, Canon came out with the Canon EOS one, which was autofocus. And a lot of the purists said, that's a fad. It's never going to stick around. Nikon, I think kind of poo pooed the whole thing. And really it cost them. Nikon had 80% market share. And within about 18 months, Canon had taken 80% because the EOS came and the, and it was the autofocus was incredible, 
but they also came with these 2.8 uh, zoom lenses, the 20 to 35 and the 70 to 200. I think it's 70 to 200, maybe it's 70 to 210. I don't know, I always get confused about that. Just know that those two zooms suddenly became viable for every news photographer I knew. So Canon really came in and took over. I was working as an intern at a newspaper and I was too broke to really buy much of anything. And so I used the Nikons as long as I could until they just got to the point where I could not rely on them to get through a single assignment. The last time I used my Nikon F4s, I was shooting a portrait in the studio and I hit the shutter and it burned through the entire roll of film without me touching the shutter. I said, that's it, I can't do this anymore. I'm making my living with a camera and this isn't working for me. So I went out and I bought a Canon EOS A2. And when I bought that A2, I switched from shooting fixed lenses into zooms. And zooms for the next five years of my life, zooms were really what I ended up using all the time. But I also had Leica stuff on the side. And anytime I did a project that was mine and not necessarily for the paper or another client, I preferred to shoot with the Leicas. And the Leicas were, were fixed lenses, 35s and 50s. And so, that really was what put the hooks in me, was using the Leica and saying, look, the 35 and the 50 primes are really what make, make me feel at home as a photographer. The zooms are practical, but, but I don't have the same relationship to them that I do of the fixed. And so over the years, I shot a 35 and a 50 with Nikon, Canon, Leica, Olympus, um, Fuji, and now I'm starting to shoot Sony equipment as well. The 35 is great. And when I was doing documentary work, when I was actually working as a photographer and traveling and doing stories, I used a 30, I used two cameras and two lenses and it was 35 and 50. 35 and 50, year after year after year. But the 50 to me was the one that was elusive. When I was first switched over to Canon and I bought those primes, I mean, I bought the zooms, I, also, I actually, in that package, I somehow ended up with a 51.4 Canon which in theory is a great lens, but that original 51.4 was made out of plastic and it was a total piece of crap that fell apart almost immediately. You could pick it up and shake it and hear the elements moving around. And so I got it and I used it a few times and I didn't like it, so I sold it. But there's something, the residue of that lens, a 50, that fixed aspect ratio of the 50, there was something about it that I kept thinking, I need to learn how to use this better. So I bought another one. Failed, sold it, bought another one, failed, sold it. It wasn't until I bought the Leica 50 that it finally clicked. And for whatever reason for me, the 50 is the focal length that I prefer more than anything else. It's a chameleon. It can, you can shoot shallow depth of field, but you can also shoot at f8 and compress things. It has just enough length to it where it gets a little bit of compression. That's why I prefer a 50 over a 35. There's nothing wrong with the 35, and if you're gonna shoot a project with one lens and you wanna do a 35, that's completely fine. I would do the same thing if that struck me as something I wanted to do. And with the Sony camera that I'm using now, I have an adapter that allows me to put my 50 and my 35 Leicas on this camera, which is um, something that I am definitely going to do, but probably only, sorry, I broke my pen. God, I just broke something else. This is probably gonna blow up on my pants. So I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna go ahead and just put this over here. I will probably do, when, this is a dream. So I've got this Sony and I've got, it's full frame. And now I have an adapter for the Leica with the 35 and the 50. My goal is to do a, an actual still project at some point. What that is, I have no idea but I have been dying to do this again. I haven't done it in years, and I'm, I'm curious if I'm good enough to do it, and I will do that at some point. That was question one. Woo, what a doozy. Question number two is about business. So funny you should ask. This, I've gotten a lot of business questions in the past few months, and so many that I have decided to do a film called Let's Talk Business about the photography business. I'm gonna break it into probably 10, 11, 12 points, the first of which is why the hell would you want to become a professional now if you're enjoying photography as an amateur? That is, I'm giving you a little, a little foreshadowing here of what this film is going to be, a little sneak peek, because that's the first question that you have to ask. There is a, it is a facade of what it means to be professional photographer online. There are so many people just talking out there, you know what, because it sells things and it builds following, but it's not necessarily accurate. Yes, I know photographers who are loving life and doing really well, but I know a lot of other people who aren't. 
and I know a third set online who are phonies, who basically are making it look as if things are great and they really aren't when you get to them behind the scenes. But I love the fact that people are interested in becoming professional photographers. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it down into the sort of brick and mortar, old school photography industry and the online industry. One is not better than the other. They are simply different industries and there is a crossover. And to me, that is the sweet spot, but I'll explain what it means to be in the brick and mortar, the actual photo industry, and what it means to be online, the pros and cons, and then why I think it's beneficial and the best idea is to work in both worlds if you possibly can. It is not easy, it is often not fun. You, you'll hear a term called the hustle. People use it sort of kind of jokingly, but also very seriously because it's not fun. And for a lot of people, the hustle is the part that they really don't want to talk about. And the hustle can be not just getting the jobs, it can be getting people to actually pay for the jobs. It's very, very strange. And the industry is continuing to evolve and change, but maybe I can shed a little light on some things that you may or may not be familiar with, especially if you came to photography through YouTube or Instagram and you came from the online side, you might not even know that there's an industry, but I have a couple of shortcuts and a couple of, of gold mines that you can mine for names and for people who are legitimate in that brick and mortar industry that I think will not only blow your mind, they will be people that you are gonna wanna try to emulate because the vast majority of the good work I see is not coming from the online space, it's coming from the actual industry still. Great question though, and again, I'm doing a whole film about this. Question number three, do you ever mix film and digital in the same project? And if so, are there any tips regarding aspect ratio? Um, the, the quick answer to the second part of your question is no. I don't, aspect ratio to me, whatever. But yes, I have mixed film and digital many times on shoots. I would not necessarily recommend it, but when you are doing a job for a client and there is a sense or need of immediacy of imagery, you have no other option than to shoot digital. That is a reality of working as a photographer. As a, Sometimes as a photographer, you dictate the materials and the techniques and how you work, and other times you can't because the job demands something else. What I would often do is cover my bases digitally and then shoot what I wanted on film. Oftentimes the clients would see what I had done on film and said, wow, we like this better than what you did for us with the digital. We thought we wanted the digital. You have to realize too, a lot of photographic clients, and this is gonna sound really weird, they don't know anything about photography and they think they do. And they don't know what good photography is because they, their job in life was not to study what good photography was. Their job is often to work for a client or a brand or an organization that has needs with, pho with photographic needs and their job is a conduit between you and the organization. They often don't know what good photography is. They don't know it when they see it. They often don't want it when they see it. They have a concept in their mind. Oftentimes digital, especially when it first arrived, there was a huge misconception about digital that it was so much cheaper than film photography. That proved to not be the case because the price of the equipment and the software and the hardware and the rentals and the tech teams and everything that had to come with digital really outweighed the cost of film. And when that became apparent, you had things, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, you had network television, you had all the Hollywood uh, shows being produced. Once they found out that they could shoot 40 rolls of 220 film a day for less than it cost to shoot digital and rent a tech and rent a van and rent all the crap that you had to have with digital, they went back to film. That's not a, a, a very well-known public thing because the industry of photography, and here we go again, talking about the business, the industry is supporting a facade. They have to, to try to keep the industry alive. So all the publications, all the media that was revolving around professional photography was all digital, digital, digital because those were the companies paying the bills. It did not help them to hear that television shows in LA went back to film. It didn't help that some of the major museums went back to archiving on film because it was far less expensive than digital. It was far less dangerous than digital. It was far a, a far better archive than digital. No one wanted to hear this. There was a 10 year period where film was like the plague. You cannot use it, you shouldn't use it, you'll go out of business, no, it's over, it's dead, it's dead, it's dead. That was led by the companies pushing all the digital technology, it makes sense. They're in the market to push all these boxes and that's what they did. Now, thankfully, mostly due to the hipster world, film came back. It's never gonna be what it was, but it came back to a certain degree. You can mix and match film and digital. I have no problem with that at all. 
And again, it's job and story specific. Or if you just love one or the other, if you're a film person, shoot film. If you, unless you have the client yelling down your throat that you can't do that. If you're just working as a hobbyist, do whatever the heck you want. Mix and match and experiment. Heck, photograph your negatives digitally and do something weird and then do a dye transfer and then, I don't know, paint by numbers. Figure it out, people. Come on. Okay, that was question number three. Question number four. How much does perception play a role when it comes to photographing people? Does the camera system you're wielding make people think you're a serious photographer or say a camera phone versus a hulking DSLR? Man, I am not a DSLR fan at all. I've never been a DSLR fan. It's not that I don't like the camera, it's that I don't like the work I make when I'm using the camera. I have a Canon 5D Mark IV and a suite of lenses. I haven't used it in years because I don't make good photographs with it. I don't know exactly why. The mirrorless cameras, I love. Film cameras, I love. Perception plays a huge part when you're photographing people. That is, I cannot stress that enough. Perception is massive. How you carry yourself, how you talk, how you look, how you dress, and yes, the cameras you use. You wanna do something fun? Rent a Hasselblad with a waist level finder and an 80 mil and go wander around and ask people to shoot portraits of them. And when you pull out that giant camera that goes rink, rink, clunk, rink, rink, clunk, and you're looking down through it, it might as well be 1850. People love it. I shot all of the vast majority of the portraiture I did for seven years, I shot a $65 Hasselblad for the entire time. I paid 65 bucks for a 501 CM, an 80, a back, and a finder. The entire package was $65. All of it combined. The lens, the back, the body, the finder, $65. For 10 years, I shot that camera commercially, professionally. Now, God knows, people have gone in crazy about this equipment, but that camera, especially when I photographed kids, there was an immediate engagement because they'd never seen anything like it. It was metal, it was heavy, it was loud, it was weird parts that came off and came in pieces. They would help me reload the film. It was a big part of it. Same thing happens when I'm in the field doing dock. I would never, ever, ever, the, the, f the fear that I would have of starting to shoot with a mobile phone on a project in the midst of that stuff, not that the mobile phone isn't a viable device, but I certainly do not under any circumstances want to be defined or lumped in with a category of people who primarily use the mobile phone. And I have friends who that's all they do. Their entire life, their entire career is, is trying to get every single human being to denounce every other form of camera and only use the, the iPhone. I can't stand making pictures with the iPhone. I, I, I use it when I absolutely have to, or if someone says, hey, you're, what kind of beer are you drinking? Can you send me a picture of the can? Yes, it works perfectly. But for projects, heck no, man. I just do not want to be associated. And people pick up on it immediately. I would say that the iPhone I've seen the iPhone work incredibly well. Kochi, Kochi Hernandez out of San Francisco, Berkeley, his street work with the iPhone is fantastic and how he works on the street with the iPhone is magical. He's way better than I would ever, ever be with that device. But for, for every one of, of him, I think there's thousands of people that sell themselves short with that camera system where it's either laziness, they don't wanna carry something, which is legit because it's a pain in the ass to carry this stuff around all the time or two, that they think that they can kind of sneak photographs, which people do with the iPhone. And if you do need to sneak, it is a really wonderful tool because everyone, no one pays any attention to you. But it's a very different way of working and just not something that fits me, my personality, or really what I want in a camera. I love looking through a camera. I would never ever hold a camera like, like this. I would never hold it out like this using the screen. It baffles me when I see photographers doing that. And again, it's a generational thing. If you grew up doing that, it makes sense. For me, I have to look through the viewfinder. That's why these little rinky-dink mirrorless cameras that everybody talks about online that don't have finders, forget it. I would never use that. Question number five, any tips for overcoming self-doubt? Oh, this guy, this guy came in with a, two questions. He snuck it in. Now, I'm gonna start trying to explain who asked these questions, but on this q and I didn't have time, so I'm racing through it. Overcoming self-doubt, practice, get good. Practice, practice, don't share your work and don't look at work online. Delete your Instagram account, 
Delete any other online way that you're sharing images. Do not share anything in real time. Don't share projects as you go. Take your time. Understand what you did right and wrong. Find a mentor who actually knows what a good photograph is. Pay them to sit with you and help edit and sequence your work. If you're trying to use the online community, especially the online photo community, for feedback about your work, it's going to blow up on you because the vast majority of people don't know anything. And they're looking at content. And content is like, again, I've said this a thousand times, something gets hot, backlit, woman, felt hat, flannel shirt, old land cruiser, dog on her lap, natural, you know, national park, waterfall, Iceland with a drone. I've seen this a gazillion times and it gets a gazillion views and likes. That's not good stuff, it's content. So you have to practice and practice and practice and find someone who knows what they're doing to help you understand what you did right and wrong. It is exactly what I had when I came up as a journalist. Every single day after every assignment, I had to go back and face a picture editor, a full-time picture editor whose only job was to edit, and they were not nice. They were not kind. This was prior to every kid getting a trophy. This was a punch in the mouth about 80% of the time. There was no filter. There was no friendly. There was no, oh, you're, you're just having an off day. It was you suck, do better, and you learned how to do that. Today, those picture editors are mostly gone, but they're out there. You can still find people, take workshops from somebody who's actually really good, and um, that will help. Do you ever use filters on your photography camera? Yes, I do. I use UV filters all the time. I take the lens caps. As soon as I get buy a lens, the lens cap gets tossed. I never use it. Um, I don't even know. I just got these Sony lenses. I have no idea where the lens caps are. I'll never use them. I put UV filters on. I'm actually using a, a neutral density filter right now that also does it's a polarizer and a neutral density i have no idea how it works it has a dial thingy on it i put it on i'll figure it out at some point but yes the answer to your question question six would i be better off using lightroom to make a blur book or book right haven't had one in a while i would appreciate your sage advice i prefer book right but book uh, lightroom is a completely viable book making tool as well but there are some pretty significant differences the beauty of Lightroom as a bookmaking tool is efficiency because you don't have to leave the software application that you're in. You can edit your images, tweak your images, and design your book all in the same piece of software. And if you go back to your develop module and tweak an image, it will change in the book. That's pretty slick. I've seen Jared Platt makes really amazing blurb Lightroom books through Lightroom. He's way better at Lightroom than I ever will be. I prefer Bookwrite because it's a little bit more robust, flavorful bookmaking tool. There are more things that you can do design-wise in book, book write than you can in Lightroom. But again, I am a software moron. I, I use these applications as little as I possibly can. I've been using Lightroom pretty much every day for the last decade. I probably understand 2% of the software. So I'm a horrible person to ask about Lightroom. People think I'm a tech person because I work for Blurb. I'm not at all. I'm a creative person. Let me see your negatives. That's what I want to see. I'm never going to watch an unboxing film. I don't care how your menus are set. I don't care about the difference between a Tamron and a Sony 50. I do not care. All I care about are your negatives or your files. Are you good? Are you getting better? Are you capturing what it is you're after? I am 100% on the aesthetic side. I don't care about digital the tech side. I don't care about digital. You know what I mean. I don't care about the techy, geeky side of photography. It's so boring. And it's why photography has been ridiculed since the inception. It's why painting and why the art community still looks down on photography. Even though photography has made some serious inroads, it really has. And, it, and it's unfair in some ways, the, 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 the sort of the damage that photography has taken from the art world because now the art world's paying attention because people are selling images for over a million bucks a piece and when that happened, boom, suddenly everyone's like, oh, hey, I better have another cup of coffee because uh, maybe I should take a look at this photography thing. Okay, question number seven is what is a field guide and how do you use it? You're the second person today that asked me that. And guess what, people? I already made a film entirely dedicated to what a field guide is and how to use it and I show the ones that I use. 
that's already done and in the can. I don't know when I'm gonna release it. I've got about 15 films that are behind the scenes already uploaded, ready for release, and I'm waiting to go on my road trip and I will be probably posting a film every two days on the road trip. That way it'll give me time to be free on the road trip and not have to try to produce anything in real time when I'm on the road because I've got a lot on my plate and I don't think I could do all of it at the same time. I'm not very good at this, as you can probably tell. So your field guide stuff, great question, but hang on and you'll wait and see that film. Question number eight is also in the same theme. Someone asked me if I would do a film about the making of AG23 in terms of the logistics of how the actual printed object came to be. I thought I'd already covered most of that, but the truth is, this is one of the most important aspects of the entire project because one of our goals with AG was to get you to say, okay, pay attention to the contributors that we're putting in front of you. And by the way, the response to the second issue has been beyond anything that I really thought I would see. I cannot believe how much positive feedback is flooding in from all over the world. So <clears throat> much, much, much appreciated. Thank you for everyone for supporting that. But another one of the goals of AG was to get you as the individual creator to say, wait a minute, um, yeah, I could submit to Milner's AG23. It's an open submission portal. Anybody in the world could submit, but I wanna do my own. That is completely viable. Or you say, I've got four other friends and we're, five of us are we're gonna do our own. That's huge. How we printed this, how we chose the, the trim size, the material, the paper, the cover type, where we printed it, how we printed it, that's a huge thing. And it's also a part of the Blurb network that very few people know about. The Blurb does offset custom printing and we have for years. But Blurb started as a print on demand company and a lot of people still think of us as one at a time books, which is in fact true. We do print on demand. That's one of a huge part of what we do. That in itself, the ability to make a single book, a single unique book, especially for a specific other person is incredibly powerful. It's something that I would say 97% of all the photographers I know do not understand. They have never taken advantage of that and it's been out there for 10 years. But on the other side of the equation is our offset custom high volume printing, which is what we used for AG because we printed 2000 copies. A lot of people don't know that's out there. They don't know how to interface. They don't know the differences between offset and POD. So I will make a film specifically about that because my hope is that someone out there, hopefully many of you, say, you know what, I can do that too. We can pool our money and easily do this and get an offset run on a publication. And whether or not you use Blurb is up to you. There's plenty of other places that you can do offset, but I'll explain how we, how we did it and why we did it. Good questions, people. Take a bow, just take the rest of the day off. Just tell your boss, I said it was okay. I went to head headquarters. Let's take him back to headquarters. Yeah, yeah, headquarters. What was that? What was the line I'm thinking of? What is your objective? My objective, people, do you know what I'm talking about? Spies like us, Chevy Chase, after they capture him, and then they go, let's take him to headquarters. And he goes, yeah, yeah, good call, headquarters. I loved early Chevy. He was so good. Do you do drugs, Danny? Every day, good. I have a question for your Q&A episodes. How do you get, this is question nine. How do you get in contact with a fixer for a photographer who considered making a doc project? I hope it's the right name. I always wonder about how pros get in touch with them. Great question. I would say that is a little bit on the high end level of the professional field. So a fixer, you will hear this often in war zones and conflict zones where people are hiring local fixers to help fix situations and fix things to get permission, travel, access, get you out of jail, keep you from being killed, all those things that fixers are known for. But fixers also help with things like documentary projects. The National Geographic, I've never worked for them, but I've assisted for them. And uh, I've seen on the research side, they have researchers that are helping out. They have fixers in the field. They've had drivers at times, teams of people around the photographer helping facilitate these stories. Fixers are also um, in the professional space, people will share fixers. So let's say for example, if I was gonna go to, I don't know, Bosnia, and I needed someone on the ground who really knew what was happening, I could reach out to a friend of mine who spent 10 years covering the war in the Balkans and say, hey, I've never asked you before, but I'm gonna go there, I'm on my own, I'm gonna need some help. Do you know anyone who's a fixer there? There are fixers uh, country specific, city specific, region specific, and it's really just asking around. It's reaching out to local journalism organizations. Um, like for example, when I worked at the paper, when I first started in the journalism world, 
photographers would come into the city I was working in and they would call the newspaper looking for assistance and I would often get the get the call because the photo editor would say, oh, we have an intern here. Yeah, I'll free him up, you know, you can work with him. Then I'd make extra money on the side assisting. I wasn't a fixer, but I was working in the same capacity as an assistant and that's how fixers worked as well. So another quick sample is uh, there's a region in Mexico where a friend of mine used to live and there's a really well-known fixer there and he's a photographic fixer. And so everybody I know that travels through is a doc photographer, a journalist, everybody's trying to get him. The magazines know him, the journalism institutions know him because he's really good. So ask around, journalism and the journalism outfits are um, a good place to start. My wife's calling me again. I'm just gonna let it go because we only have one question left. Uh, here's a question. When, when you die, that's, that's pretty sobering. Would you rather all your creative work was either A, archived in the Dan Milner Memorial Library for kids who don't read good, yes, Zoolander reference, love that, or be shot out of a cannon with your corpse, I'm guessing that is a Hunter S. Thompson reference, which I also greatly appreciate. I'm trying to be funny, but I guess the somewhat serious question is, does you care about leaving some sort of creative legacy? I do not. I do not care about a creative legacy. I do not care about my archive. I do not care about being known as a photographer. I do not care about any of that. When I go, I go. The world will not skip a beat. My family will not skip a beat. My friends will not skip a beat. And that is precisely the way I would want it to be. I am a speck of dust traveling around this universe and I am nothing more. So the, the, the reality is that what I was able to produce over 28 years of working as a photographer is nothing. It's irrelevant. So yes, do I have some images that I think are decent? Do I have some stories that I think are decent that I'm proud of? Yes. Does that matter to anyone on the planet outside of me? No. And I say all the time, like if I push came to shove, if I moved somewhere where I was limited for space, if I moved somewhere where it was difficult for me to take, I would throw my entire archive away. I am not attached to it in one, one sense of the form, nothing. And I know that's hard for people to believe. I think if, if that is something that is important to you, creating a real archive, a valuable archive, something that you can live off down the road, then by all means, you should take it 100% serious. Because, and I just had this conversation with another photographer yesterday, we were talking about friends of ours who are now at the age where they are living off of their archives. Without their archives, they would be in serious financial trouble. They have archives that are valuable. They have archives that they own the rights to all of the work outright. No one owns anything on them. They own their copyright. They own every single image they've ever made. They made great work. They made unique work. They photographed things that had value and, and, and value long into the future. One of these guys is traveling nonstop around the world doing exhibitions and he is living a five-star life and it's 100% based on his archive. A lot of younger photographers, a lot of online people, don't think this is real. It is very, very real. The difference between them and me is their bodies of work were more extensive. There were more of them. They worked for 40 and 50 years full time and they worked during a period where they were able to create that kind of work easily, more easily than you could today. It's still doable today. I still know people who are doing it today. It's different. For me personally, I don't care. I don't have any attachment to this stuff. I love doing photography. I love making pictures. I think about it all the time, but it is not something that really defines me. It's a part of who I am. So is cycling and hiking and fishing and climbing and um, being an uncle and all the other things that we are in our lives. So that's it. What a great round of questions. I really appreciate everybody sending them in. And remember, I'm just one person with one opinion. So don't freak out if I say something that you go, what an a-hole. You should have known that before you even watched that I was an a-hole. You could have talked to my family. They would have just filled you in right away. So uh, that's it. I appreciate the time, and I will be back with yet another Q&A at some point soon.